So this is the right room if you have come for the talk on open platform for enterprise AI. Uh, my name is Arun Gupta. I lead the open ecosystem team at Intel. Uh, and I'm really excited to talk about this project that we launched with the Linux Foundation and how does it help you build Gen AI pipelines in a cloud native way. It's a standard antitrust policy notice from the LF. Now, since the last couple of years, Gen AI has definitely you know, emerged very strongly. Every customer, every enterprise, every developer, everybody in the world is looking at it, how they can leverage it more effectively. But enterprises are struggling to realize it. How do I gain the value out of it? How do I put it into production? What should my development initiatives look like, et cetera? This is a survey by Gartner. And in this survey, Gartner basically calls out what are sort of your top three reasons on why enterprises are struggling. And if you think about it, the first one really is about technical implementation. Gen AI is cool. Is chat GPT enough for me? How do I build that on top of chat GPT? Or what are the other elements that I should be looking at? Cost of running these Gen AI initiatives is a big one. Like, if I were to create my own model, that requires extensive compute resources. That requires multiple months. Should I fine tune it? Or should I do something else? And how do I put that into action? And last but not the least is the talent. Because the whole technology is so new, how do I get these people? Should I bring a data scientist on my team? What about my existing developer? Should I add data scientists in addition to developers? And what will I do with them in the long run? So that's the common question. Those are my typical top three reasons on why you know, these Gen AI initiatives are becoming a bit more challenging. I'll put a little pin on this. If you look at the ecosystem complexity on what is really challenging to get these Gen AI initiatives working for us, first and foremost is the ease of development and deployment. I've been investing into my hyperscalers, CSPs, that's where all my hardware is sitting. Should I procure new hardware? Should I be investing a lot more in GPUs? How should my hardware look like? How does my development cycle look like? I've been a Spring Boot developer so far. I'm building Node.js application. How do I leverage that skill to bring Gen AI initiatives as part of that? Is that a new terminology, new paradigm on top of that? What is my return on investment? And you've probably seen some reports more recently as more and more large companies are heavily investing into GPUs, but they are slowing down because they don't know what the return on investment looks like. You know, what should I, like, when, when am I gonna start realizing benefit out of it? Security always stays at the top. You know, there have been cases where people have put in their PII, personal identifiable information into the LLM, and that PII, like a social security number, showed up somewhere else. So that's challenging. You know, what if my LLM has a security vulnerability? How do I patch it up? What are the models around it? And last but not the least, what is the use case that I start with? Is chatbot the canonical example? How can I go beyond chatbot? Can I do fault tracking? Can I do vulnerability management? You know, can I do um, research and discovery? End of the day is, what are my benefits? Am I getting faster production? Am I improving efficiency? Am I saving money? Am I reducing the effort to build a particular proof of concept? That's sort of what enterprises are looking at it. If you look at it from a technical perspective, this is the general flow that developers think about when they put sort of a Gen AI pipeline. And when you think in terms of Gen AI pipeline, there are multiple components that you look at it. And let me walk you through some of the flows over here so that you understand it slightly better. So on the left is what you see is your enterprise data. And that's sitting in a range of repositories. Could, it, could be your emails, your PDFs, your ERPs, wherever you want it to be. Now, what you want to do is you want to take that data into consideration and put a Gen AI system on top of it so that you can actually be more effective. Now, there are typically three different ways that the customer take that route. The first one is where they say, all right, I'm going to take a LLM. I'm going to create, or rather, I'm going to create my own LLM. That's going to take a lot of time, compute resources, et cetera. Second approach is where they say, I'm going to take an existing LLM, whether it's closed source like 
ChatGPT um, or OpenAI's model, or I'm going to take an open source model like, um, say, Llama or any other model. And then I'm going to fine tune it. And because fine tune it, because I'm going to really make sure that the model works better for my use cases. And that again requires compute resources extension. The last part really is the retrieval augmented generation. So what they do is they take a model and before you send a prompt to it, it looks at the prompt, it digs into your enterprise data, gathers the data out of it, the relevant data out of it, and then it sends it to the LLM. Because then the LLM is really getting the prompt engineered and then it can return the response back to you. So making your own LLM, fine tuning an LLM, or RAG, sort of the typical paths that are being taken over here. And in this case, for example, if you look at it, my user query really comes over here. You know, I take, look, take a look at the embedding model because my input is coming in there. I extract the data out of it. I dig into my vector database. That's where my embeddings, all my enterprise data is stored. I gather the information out of it. That is the one where I'm doing prompt engineering. I send that to the LLM. Now, when the response comes out of LLM, that's where I put my guardrails, that what are my security considerations? What data should be given out? What data should not be given out? And that's the response going back to the customer, essentially. So this is where the Linux Foundation announced a new project at the last open source summit in Seattle, OPIA, Open Platform for Enterprise AI. And what this platform is about, how you can simplify the development, the production, and the adoption of Gen AI in enterprise. And I'll show you those elements on how we make that work. So what is OPIA? Um, think of it as three different things. One is, it's a framework of composable microservices. Now, in the previous diagram, as I explained to you, when you're creating a Gen AI application, there are multiple components. Those components, consider them as microservices. Embedding, retriever, re-ranker, vector database, LLM, those are all of your microservices. So essentially, OPIA is a framework of these composable microservices that can be composed together to give you a blueprint. Now, a blueprint is all of these microservices working together to give you a Gen AI application. A Gen AI application is um, a RAG application. It's a chatbot is a doc summarizer, um, it's an agentic workflow, it could be whatever you want it to be. You start with a microservice, you get a blueprint on top of that, and then the last part of OPIA is really, okay, you got a blueprint up there, that's a great start, but then how do I take it forward? Like, how do I know whether it's enterprise ready? What is the security level? So OPIA in that sense defines a framework by which you can evaluate those Gen AI applications and take it forward. If I further level it up, think of the microservices and the blueprints is the construction element of OPIA. And this on the, on the right is the evaluation element. So what? think of it OPIA as a framework which allows you to construct a Gen AI pipeline and evaluate a Gen AI pipeline. And I'll dig into the details of each one of those a little bit more. Let's Take a look at it from a different way in terms of the architecture. As we talked about, there are multiple microservices. There are about 20 microservices that we have created so far. Embedding, retriever, re-ranking, guardrail, data preparation, so on and so forth. Multiple microservices, as I said, are composed together to create a Gen AI application. And in terms of OPIA, that's called as a mega service. And again, the mega service examples is your chatbot, your RAG workflows, on whatever you want to create over there. Now, that's great. That mega service is, you could potentially have multiple mega services that are deployed. Those mega services are accessible using a gateway. And gateway is really your entry for your incoming request. So essentially, your user talks to the gateway. Gateway then knows how to route to the mega service. And then within the mega service, where it should go to the microservice. So all of that interaction happens at that level. Now, take it forward is open source projects. Take a look at the GitHub repo here, github.com slash opr-project. 
Now, I'm going to walk you through the GitHub repo in a second, but if you take a look at it, on the top right, we have GenAI comps. That repo is the microservices, the component level microservices that I talked about. All of that code is sitting over there. On the top left is GenAI examples. These are my blueprints. These are my GenAI examples. And I'm going to walk you through some of those as well. Uh, then, of course, there's a GenAI infra repo, which is where all my infrastructure code sits. And on the bottom left is my GenAI eval, which is where my evaluation framework sits. So how do you evaluate a particular framework? And of course, this is an open source project, so we've got a governance repo, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. So let me dig into the repo and walk you through this a little bit. So if I look at my GenAI comms, within the comms, I have all of these different microservices whether it's a data prep microservice or an embedding microservice or a fine tuning or a guardrail. So we have about 20 odd microservices that are sitting over there right now. Now, using these microservices, if I go to the GenAI examples, in this is where my GenAI applications are sitting. So for example, I have a chat Q&A example here, which is like my canonical chatbot that is leveraging RAG. And in terms of RAG, you could either feed it a PDF, and then it's going to take that data and spit out the results based upon that data, or you could give it a link, and then it'll consume the website and then say, aha, I'm a bit more knowledgeable. And why that is relevant is because the LLM that you might be using, if it's an open source LLM or a closed source LLM for that sake, because the LLM was, if say, let's say if it's open source, the open source LLM is released a few days, weeks, months ago, so the knowledge is gapped right there. Anything that has happened after it, it doesn't know about it. And that's exactly where you say, aha, here is my enterprise. And anyway, it doesn't have access to your enterprise data. So that's where RAG is very relevant. So this is chat Q&A is a very classic example for that. And I'm going to walk you through some of those um, use cases as well. So let's see what other use cases are there. Now, these are some of my blueprints that are existing over there. So as I talked about it, chat Q&A is a simple RAG chat Q&A. There is a code translator which takes the language in one programming, which takes the code in one programming language and translates that into a different programming language. I have a code generator, just like GitHub Copilot. You can give a comment and boom, it generates a code for you. Uh, I have a doc summarizer. You know, you can give it a whole bunch of docs, PDFs, research papers, and it'll create a summary document for you. Or you could have like a FAQ generator. Give it a whole bunch of like, you know, PDFs and say generate a easy to understand FAQ document for me. So these are blueprints that you can start with and play around with it if you want to create your own Gen AI application. So that's the way you want to think about it. And if I talk through my chat Q&A workflow essentially, now on the bottom left I have data preparation phase. That's how I start. So that's where I'm gathering my enterprise data, PDF, website, emails, whatever it is. You can plug in different data sources if you want it. You extract the information from that, you chunk it out so that it's in smaller pieces. For each chunk, you create an embedding, which is a data format. And that embedding is the one that is actually stored in the vector database. And the whole value premise of a vector database is because it's an embedding, similar data is stored closer to each other. The searches are a lot more efficient, and that's where RAG is very relevant. Now. We have done the data preparation, and that data preparation can keep going on forever because, of course, new enterprise data is being generated, so you can keep that data fresh. But now your query comes in. From the query, you extract the prompt. You create the embedding. Based upon that embedding, you make a search into the vector database. Then you grab the relevant data from the vector database, and that becomes your engineered prompt. That's where you have done the prompt engineering. And that prompt is the one that goes to LLM and you return the response back. It's a lot more simplified flow. There's a lot more that goes on behind the scene because it retrieves multiple responses and it ranks them, which is a relevant one. And that's the one it returns back. But just to give you the concept of what a chat bot with a RAG flow would potentially look like. And as I talked about, this is really a mega service which consists of multiple microservices. So if you look here, this is my chat Q&A service. This is my chat Q&A service. And in the chat Q&A service, it says, 
I consist of one, two, three, and four mi microservices. This is an embedding, this is a retriever, this is a re-ranker, and this is an LLM microservice. So these are my four microservices making my one blueprint or a mega service, as we say in the OPL land. All right, let me show you a chatbot live in action. Um, the flight was a bit bumpy coming here. You know, fortunately, the weather is not that bad. <laughs> I will get my run in this morning you know, in a rain. But in the flight, I could manage to write a post that how do you deploy a cloud-based AI chatbot? And what that means is I wanted to deploy the chat Q&A example on Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. And I got those instructions going on for a while because ultimately it's cloud native, so it doesn't matter you know, what hyperscaler you choose. All you need is a bare metal or a VM, wherever it's sitting. And so these instructions, and I'm gonna post this link um, as part of my uh, summary, and the slides will be available to you. But essentially, what I've done is, I fired up a Ubuntu VM. Actually, let me go through the demo here. So what I have here is, uh, this is the AWS console. And this, by the way, the same exact example is working on Microsoft Azure and GCP Google Cloud as well. So all we need is a Ubuntu VM. So what I did is I fired up an EC2 instance here. This is the M7i 4X Lodge. M7i instance is based upon Intel Sapphire Rapids. So that's that. And uh, what it gives you is um, 16 CPUs and about 64 gigabyte of memory. Um, I fired up the instance and um, then I have connected to the instance here, okay? So let's make sure the connectivity is still good. All right, awesome. So in this, what I've done is, uh, I have, if you can look here, so all my containers are running. So essentially what I'm doing is at the back end, I've fired up a Docker Compose file, which brings, downloads all the images for me, files up the containers and get the service up and running. The sudo docker container ls shows you the list of containers that is running right now, okay? And what I've done is I've set up the host IP as a variable, which is a private IP for the host here. And I'm gonna copy this command here, which is, it's gonna, so host IP 888 is where my gateway is running. So I make a request to the gateway, and it says, if you, if you look at the URL here, it says v1, and that's where my API versioning in the j, uh, gateway happens. And I'm saying v1 chat q and I'm sending you a JSON content, and I'm just saying what is OPL, okay? So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna copy this command here, and I'm gonna paste it into my EC2 instance here. Now, let's pause here. When I asked what is OPL, it says uh, Oklahoma Public Employees Association. Well, the model is a bit dated, so it doesn't know what OPL is. You know, the model was blocked well, model was free frozen uh, before OPR project was launched, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is I am going to give the model a link that, hey, take this link and improve your knowledge based upon that link, okay? So let's do that. So I'm gonna go here. And I like this simple commands because it really allows me to play with them. So see, what I'm doing here is now I'm giving it a data prep service to 6007 port. This is my data prep service. I'm saying, hey, just read this link and improve your knowledge based upon that link. This could have been a PDF as well. Link is a lot easier to give. So now, I am just gonna give that link here. It's gonna take a few seconds. It's gonna prepare the model, understand the language, and it says, yep, I got it. So now, let's do that same question again, okay? So we're saying, what is OPL? So now I hit enter. Now the model has been trained with that data. And now, of course, the model returns the right information that OPR stands for Open Platform for Enterprise AI. So a simple example, it shows you the power of RAG that before and after how it works. All we are running is a Ubuntu VM. It could run wherever. So far, I've been able to run it on the three major cloud platforms. We also have a Kubernetes version of it. So the thing that I was playing with, I didn't find it very intuitive. How do I fire up a Kubernetes cluster on GKE? So I'm playing with that, I'm struggling with it, I'll eventually get to it, but the instructions are there. The whole idea is, the way I got these instructions running for Docker Compose on the three CSPs, I wanna get the same thing done on EKS, GKE, and AKS, because these are all Kubernetes platform, because all we need is a stock Kubernetes cluster, and then it'll fire up.
So what is the value of OPF? Well, I mean, that you would expect from any open source project is 100% open. Now you can take a look at it. And remember, it's an open platform. It's not necessarily have to be open source. So for example, um, as part of the chatbot Q&A, we use Redis as the vector database as the backend. Now you may think about it that, oh, maybe Redis doesn't scale, or maybe I wanna use a Valky, or maybe I wanna use something else, or maybe I wanna use open source, um, or maybe Pinecone as a managed service. That is entirely possible. Because end of the day, it's a microservice, it's an open platform, you can bring in whatever you want. Or maybe you don't want to use a open source LLM because hosting an open source LLM requires you to understand the resources, how you're gonna manage it, how much CPU, GPU, resources, et cetera, is gonna be taken. I'm good with OpenAI, so I'm just gonna use the OpenAI chat interface or their backend, and I can delegate to that. So open, both open and closed medals are welcome because it's an open platform. Um, it's very um, ubiquitous, you know, no matter where what your compute platform is, it's gonna run over there on the edge, on the cloud, in the data center, on the client laptop. So one of the deployment platforms for OPI is uh, AIPC, which was a category that we announced last year. So it's basically um, a, any Windows laptop that you buy off the shelf, you know, it would just run over there. Important part of this is also, this is hardware agnostic. And let me get into that part actually. So as an open source project, this project is run by a technical steering committee, you know, um, because Intel contributed most of the code to begin with. So we got two people from the Intel on the steering committee, but as you can see, it's a really good diverse set of folks over here. Vendors, end users, customers, partners are living over there. And more recently, what I'm super excited, as I talked about cross hardware vendor support, there is somebody from AMD. AMD is actually a, a proof partner now. You know, they are very excited to join in. Why do customers join OPF? You know, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but the whole idea is, well, take a look at working groups. Most of the work happens in the working group. And we have a onboarding working group, which is a developer experience working group. We've got an end user working group where end users are discussing on why they care about OPIA. Um, we've got an evaluation working group where the benchmark discussions happen. A community working group where marketing community communications work happen. Research, because a lot of it is around LLM research. That's where those discussions happen. And security, of course. So let's talk about partners for a second. And the reason those wiggly boxes are because AMD and ByteDance, they literally joined us last week. That's what I'm excited about. Now, when of course Intel contributed the project to LF, we got this running on Xeon, which is our x86 server, and Gaudi, which is our GPU accelerator. So we enabled it and validated it on both of those platforms. It doesn't matter where they are running essentially. But now with AMD coming in, uh, last week in the technical steering committee meeting, they provided that, hey, we are gonna be validating all of these samples on the AMD hardware and integrate them as part of the CI CD pipeline. And that's pretty cool because that really starts extending the support. Um, ByteDance, they are an end user. The reason they joined it is because they say, hey, we got multiple these of these Gen AI initiatives running within our company and they're all bespoke and we don't talk to each other and we're all creating the same set of microservices again and again. And we wanna standardize on something, one platform. There is nothing like this exists as they looked at it. That's where OPI is appealing to them. So now we are talking to ByteDance to understand what are all these initiatives running out and it, it turns out 80% of those microservices are common. And they think, ha, we're just gonna use OPI, those microservices and a couple that we are creating our own if they're not proprietary, we're gonna contribute back to OPI. And that's pretty much the flow that everybody has been looking at it. And that's frankly how we created OPI projects because Intel was running multiple Gen AI initiatives and those were all like bespoke, not talking to each other. And then we realized, nah, what's the purpose? And there's so much overlap. Let's create something common. Um, Infosys, again, same story. Infosys is trying to validate Gen AI, build Gen AI pipeline so that they can guide their customers. Now they're in the process of creating a dedicated team that is gonna contribute to OPIA. Um, Data Strato, you know, their team is very excited about the developer onboarding experience. How do we onboard developers and customers on, that's where they started the developer experience working group. Clarify runs a MLOps platform and that's the element that they are interested into. 
So pretty much DStack, again, an open source alternative to Kubernetes. And the way we have written Docker Compose and Kubernetes Helm charts, they want to create something similar and to be able to deploy these applications. Red Hat uh, has this concept of validated patterns. That's the language the OpenShift customers understand, which is their managed Kubernetes version, a full developer platform. And that's the part where Red Hat is contributing validated patterns so that then OPS solutions are available in the OpenShift environment to their customers in a very, very native manner. So pretty much I can go JFrog, you know, uh, it's a supply chain company. They announced uh, JFrog ML, which is how they manage sort of a full machine learning end-to-end -end life cycle. And they also have a model repository and artifactory sitting on back of that. So that's an integration that we are having with them that, hey, how could we have that end-to-end -end integration as part of OPR? Um, Docker, we are talking to them about inner loop. Like, you're sitting on the desktop, and as you are doing your CI, CD, you know, how can I provide quick feedback to developers as they're building their Gen AI pipelines? So endless discussion. Um, I met somebody at um, an event last week from GitHub. Now, if you think about the component-level microservices, those are great. There were about 20 of those. But if you were to make your own Gen AI example, you need to understand those microservices. So the discussion that we had with the GitHub person is, can you help me craft a custom copilot on top of those component level microservices? Because if you create a copilot on top of that, then I can go in and then you can say, yeah, here is a microservice, here is a mega service I want to create, or Gen AI example I want to create, and help me quickly bring in the right microservices with the right interfaces, so on and so forth. And then spin out my Docker Compose file or spin out my Kubernetes Helm chart. So simplify that end-to-end -end development use case. Now, as I talked about it, in terms of the deployment environment, it could be deployed on a wide range of platforms. It doesn't matter. Any of the hyperscalers would work. Uh, in addition to Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, I've been looking at Oracle Cloud and IBM Cloud. Of course, Intel Developer Cloud, it works. Uh, we have enabled and validated Gaudi Accelerator, which is Intel's GPU. Uh, we have enabled NVIDIA GPU. The validation has to be done by a partner or a customer if they care about it. Of course, it works on any Kubernetes cluster, so that gives you a really a large range of compute platforms where it could be deployed. Private data center talked about OpenShift. Canonical. Canonical has this thing called as data science stack, which is how they promote machine learning to their end customers. Canonical also has this charmed Kubernetes by which you can run Kubernetes on a local desktop. So those are our touch points where we are looking at it. How can we integrate OPI as part of that and be, make it present and available so that it's quick and easy for you to spin up your Gen AI applications? AI PC I talked about already. That's the, your local laptop. So in terms of the roadmap, what we have done is um, we are sort of in the final quarter, getting into the final quarter of Q4, uh, sorry, 2024. Um, we have launched OPIA. We are heading towards 1.0 later this month. That's where we are looking at it. We are in the final doc sprint to make sure we provide the most accessible developer experience for you to get started. That's an element that we are looking at it. Um, we have done the integration of a lot of the open models, but then as we go forward, we are looking to bring in any closed models as well. So if you folks are interested, by all means, contribute. Um, simple RAG architectures have been created, but as we go forward, what are the elements we're going to look at? We're going to start looking at multimodality, because so far we have done only text-based interfaces. But we're starting to expand videos and images. There are some basic examples that are already sitting in Gen AI examples. So that's worth a look. Um, Multi-agent workflow is something that we are starting to look at it that how can we create a more like a autonomous um, machine learning? So that's an element that we're looking at it. Now, in order to simplify developer onboarding and create more fun use cases, we are hosting a hackathon. Starting September 30th to October 31st is a month long hackathon. And in that month long hackathon, um, we, the developers, the maintainers of the project are gonna be available to help you onboard the project and then help you contribute to the project. What are we looking for in terms of contribution? New blueprints. Take a look at Gen AI examples and tell me what examples are missing that could be directly relevant to you. So we would love to see those contributions come through. 
deployment to multiple compute platforms. You know, what I have, what I have here, for example, is just a gist. You know, it's a lot of instructions you have to follow to get this going. It's fun for the first time, maybe second time, third time it gets boring. So what we are looking for is cloud formation, Terraform templates, Ansible scripts, whatever works for you, because the instructions are over there. So really help us craft those solutions by which you can automate that with a single click. Here is your Terraform template and you can get this entire thing deployed. Now single click, spin up your Kubernetes cluster and then boom, I got this thing up and running for you. So there's a lot of infinite choices that you can do. Uh, clean up existing docs and create new docs. Those, that's sort of how the developer gets started, new tests. So I think there's a range of input that you can provide that you can contribute and get introduced to the project. So what I would say is, um, in GitHub, if you do a global search on Opia hack, that's your tag, and all the issues are tagged with that. So in that way, it gives an idea of what you can contribute to. And we are also working on new first issue. So if you're a first-time open source user, if you're a first-time contributor, we're also gonna participate as part of Hacktoberfest. So lots of different ways by which you can engage. So this is your uh, primary website. Now this is where sort of the landing page for you is gonna be opia-project.github.io and that brings you up all the getting started document and this is where the big focus is for the next couple of weeks on making sure the docs are existing a little bit sparse right now but this is where we are pushing the envelope that okay how do I improve the docs how do I make it the best developer onboarding experience a five minutes of aha how do I build all of that experience so Opia.dev is your landing page, and everything is linked from there. Um, join the working groups, participate, give it your examples. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir, there is. Thank you for bringing that up. I forgot to mention that partner in my partner side. Uh, we have been working with the UN, uh, UN Statistical Division particularly, and they say that, hey, Arun, vector database is good, but we store all of our census data in a graph database. And I think I just um, summoned uh, Alexi, you know, he works for Neo4j. <laughs> so we have been working with Neo4j specifically uh, to bring that graph drag implementation as part of Opia. So one of the examples that we are looking to contribute over that Neo4j is looking to contribute is essentially, yes, replace the Redis backend, bring the graph backend in there and get that sample working. And what does it mean? How does that change the pipeline? How does that change the workflow? So all of that is under very active discussion. Yeah, so hopefully in the next few days, weeks, you should see a pull request. Um, and Alexi has heard the use case, so he can go nudge his bosses again. You were going to conference talk, so could you explain that? Perfect. Okay, so there we go. That's a conference-driven development. Let me get there actually. So if I look at docs and I look at framework, and if I look at framework, this is a markdown. There's a tech, there's a binary version of it. What I'm showing you is a text version of it. It's easier to parse. And if I go down here in that, so it talks about sort of when you're talking about evaluation of Gen AI systems, what does it talk in terms of evaluation? Like you know, assessment, grading, and certification if offered. Certification is not offered right now, but that's eventually the path that we can get to. But in terms of grading, performance, features, trustworthiness, enterprise readiness is what we are looking at it. And if you go down here further, it talks about what does that assessment really mean? You know, when you're looking at sort of um, the grading structure, right? This is what you were asking specifically. So in terms of performance, features, and trustworthiness, um, for example, for each category, the assessments will be set at three different levels. Are you an entry level? Are you a market level? Are you an advanced level? 
and the exact specific framework and the tool that needs to be used is still under active discussion because then we can say that, oh, you know what? This stack is validated at this level and is available on this and this hyperscaler or this and this uh, hardware software stack. I am not uh, entirely familiar with that, but that's something on active discussion, and I can provide more details uh, as a follow-up. Yeah, so um, end of the day, if you think about the model, right, model is a backend microservice actually. So let me sh bring up another slide actually. So this is a little bit more detailed version of the architecture diagram that I showed. And if you, if I walk you through this, this is the ingest data phase. So it goes to the UI server. Then it goes through all these different microservices. So it's, these are mostly lang chain services. And um, you go through these services and ultimately store your result in a vector database over here, right? Now, that's the data preparation phase, which we showed on the left side. Now on the right side is what we show the user query part of it. So user comes over here, makes a query, goes to the chat Q&A gateway. Then it goes to the mega service, and in the mega service, it goes through a series of changes. Now, this is where your LLM is. Right now, the LLM, the TGI, the text generation interface LLM service, is sitting as a container, essentially, for me. Now, if your model gets updated, then this is nothing different than you know, doing a rolling upgrade of your application. So essentially, if your application, say, for example, is running as a Docker Compose on, say, five nodes, then you do a rolling upgrade of your model across these on, on these nodes, and then the new model becomes effective. So it's a very there is no difference in terms of how you would upgrade the model. Does that? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you guys like it, you can stop by Intel booth, and we'll be giving out OPR T-shirts, <laughs> and. Um, so please stop by Intel booth. I'll be hanging out there if you have any questions, if you want to chat more about it. I would love to see you there. Thank you so much.